Well, I'd certainly like to welcome everyone to the uh, Wednesday night services. Uh, and I'm privileged again, once again, to be able to present a lesson to you, and hopefully it's uh, of use to you. I'd like to kind of go back in history a little bit. In a handbill written by Abraham Lincoln on July the 31st, 1846, in which he replied to a, a charge of infidelity, and that's not infidelity to his wife, but it's infidelity to the Christian religion. He stated, uh, quote, that I am not a member of any Christian church is true, but I have never denied the truth of the scriptures, and I have never spoken with intentional disrespect of religion in, in general or of any denomination of Christians in particular. Well, I think uh, perhaps uh, you know he recognized the differences in the Christian denominations, that they all could not be right in their doctrine, but all could be wrong. So he just decided not to be a part of any. Whether that was his thinking or not, I don't know, but it's plausible. But I must say he was very knowledgeable about the Bible and scriptures, and he accepted that the most high rules in kings and in the kingdom of men, Daniel uh, 417 et al. On September the 2nd, 1862, he wrote with respect to the great contest in which uh, the nation was then engaged. He quotes, the will of God prevails in great contest each party claims to act in accordance with the will of God both may be and one must be wrong again uh, God cannot be for and against the same thing at the same time in his second inaugural address that's the great with malice toward none with charity for all speech he said much the same thing there, he said, respecting the two contestants in that civil war, that each side, quote unquote, each side looked for an easier triumph and a, a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. Uh, of course, he knew that couldn't be true. As I said before, he acknowledged that it was God's will that ruled in the lives of men, whether men understood it or not. In a conversation with one of his advisors during the Civil War, the advisor purportedly said he was grateful God was on the Union side. Lincoln told him, sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side, my greatest concern is to be on God's side, for God is always right. Joshua, the leader of the Israelite army, was about to battle Jericho. And he fell in the much the same trap as Lincoln's advisor. In Joshua 5th chapter, verses 13 and 14, we read, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face on the earth and worshipped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? The reason that, that the angelic uh, being replied no, or, or as we may say, neither one, was for the same reason as the reply Lincoln gave to his advisor. The question should not have been, are you God on our side? But rather, are you Joshua and the Israelites on the Lord's side? This is the theme of the song, song that we sing from time to time, Who Will Follow Jesus? The refrain of which is the reply to the question, I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Life is full of 
complexities and challenges sometimes we're surprised that our plans don't just don't seem to be working out for us why aren't things working out the way i thought they would one may ask maybe it's because we made our decisions all wrong we came up with our plans without consulting god and yet we still expected him to fall in line with our ideas Perhaps, in the sense that Joshua did, we should first fall face down and say, as Jesus did, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done, Luke 22nd chapter, verse 42. That's when the Lord's goals become our goals, and our plans and priorities are aligned with his. In a similar vein, we read in Exodus, the 32nd chapter, verse 26, a query that Moses directed at the children of Israel. Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. Moses had been on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments from God. The idolatrous Israelites grew impatient by the delay in the return of Moses. They pressured Aaron to create a golden calf for them to worship. Yes, Aaron was weak in that he did not oppose the appeal of the people for an idol to worship. As they were engaged in their idolatrous worship of the golden calf, as well as acts of debauchery, Moses marches into the camp. As the record says, Moses was hot in his anger. He cast down the tablets of stone, tore down the calf, burned it, ground it up into powder, mixed it with water, and make, made them drink it. He cries, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves to, together to him. Then came that just but terrible command to execute the idolaters and 3,000 of the people perished. To the rest, the Lord said, whoever, whoever has sinned against me, I won't blot him out of my book. Now therefore go, lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit for punishment, I will visit punishment upon them for their sin. So the Lord plagued the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron made. Find that in Exodus 32nd chapter verses 33 to 35. The question that we must consider is would we be numbered with the Levites or with the idolatrous multitude? What must we do to be on the Lord's side? We could say as a prophet said in Michael, Micah, the sixth chapter, verse eight. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require you but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And we certainly couldn't go wrong in doing that. There's a similar sentiment uh, expressed in Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, verses 12 and 13. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Without a doubt, if we live in harmony with these two preceding citations, we will be on the Lord's side. What deserves further elucidation is the full meaning and depth of the words good, justly, mercy, a humble walk with God. Perhaps I, of course, at a later date, or someone else will have a lesson on that. Regardless, uh, I'll continue with my comments here. When it comes to doing the right thing as the Bible defines the right, will we, without doubt or fear, follow whatever the God of truth leads us? In trying times, would Moses save us as he did the Levites? They have observed your word and kept your covenant. Deuteronomy 33, verse 9. 
So what must one do to be counted on the Lord's side? First, we must recognize that we will be on someone's side that is unavoidable. Therefore, we must want to be on the Lord's side. That is, we must decide positively to be on the Lord's side and do whatever, he, whatever it takes to be so. As recorded in Jeremiah the 6th chapter, verses 16 and 17, the Lord said, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Also, I set watchmen over you, saying, Listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not listen. But this is a matter of the will with them, and so it is with us. The Lord is telling them how to be on his side, but they just did not want to. In 2 Corinthians 8, chapter verse 5, it was said of the Macedonians who gave liberally liberally out of their poverty for the relief of the Jews in the Jerusalem area that they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Each of the Macedonians then had first resolved within themselves to accomplish this good deed. And they did accomplish it, notwithstanding the doubts harbored by many, including Paul, of their ability to do so. The Lord God has never expected anyone to be on his side without adequate evidence that his side is the right place to be. Well, how is this done? Moses began to explain the law to the Israelites before they entered the land of promise, Deuteronomy, the first chapter, verse 1 and 5. Further, the Lord commanded him, Moses, to teach the people his statutes and judgments that they were to obey in the land in which they were crossing over the Jordan to possess. And that's in Deuteronomy the sixth chapter, verse one. As part of this teaching, Moses relayed the following in the verse four through six or through nine of that uh, same sixth chapter. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, and so forth. The love of the Lord was predicated on the words which the Israelites were taught and commanded to follow. God is truth. As was written in Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, verse 4, he is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. As Jesus said about himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, verse 6. Pretense in the absence of truth is but a lie. The lie may glitter, but it is just fool's gold. The prophet Isaiah wrote to the house of Jacob the warning found in Isaiah 48th chapter verse 1. Hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel, and have come forth from the wellsprings of Judah, who swear by the name of the Lord and make mention of the Lord uh, of the God of Israel but not in truth or in righteousness. As the word of Jesus that were recorded in John 17, 17 say, your word is truth. Indeed, his words are truth. There must be a genuine love of the truth, however. In 2 Thessalonians 2 chapter verse 9 through 12, Paul describes a lack of love of the truth as a cause of the deception of those who perish. Lord has never asked us to blindly follow statements claimed to be the truth as one would follow an idol without proof. The events leading up to Sinai provided proof of the promises of God and that he was indeed the one to whom they owed their allegiance. God provides us with evidence 
and he expects us to work with that evidence to prove him or, or any of his propositions to be true and therefore worthy of obedience. Paul tells Timothy that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. Although we may prove from nature that a designer creator is behind it all, Romans 1 verse 20, it is scripture that is a starting point of proving what God says. In 1 Thessalonians 5th chapter verse 21, we are told to test all things, hold fast what is good. Testing is a gathering of pertinent, pertinent evidence. Examining that evidence, considering what can logically be proved to be good or to contribute to good, and then draw those conclusions and only those conclusions warranted by the evidence so examined. Once proved, we are told to hold on to that which is good with all of one's determination and might. Paul has recorded in 2 Timothy 2 uh, 15, tells Timothy, and by extension, us to be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Our evidence evidence begins with the word of God, the truth. Using principles of logic and evidence, we are to rightly divide the word of truth. To be pleasing to God requires effort, effort, diligent effort. One does not accidentally or inadvertently fall into favor with God, or as our theme says, to be on the Lord's side. It requires a conscious decision to do so. So our minds must be engaged. In 1 John 4, 1, we read, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So our situation is not so different in fundamentals than that of the Israelites at Sinai. Yet in proving the veracity of God's word, we are in a much more advantageous position than the Israelites of old. Did they have ad adequate evidence to prove the truthfulness of God's word? Well, yes, they did. Would we be like these idolatrous Israelites and worship a golden calf? Perhaps many do. You may say that if we had their proof and saw what they saw, we would not worship the golden calf. But we do have their proof, and by testimony we see what they saw. These things the Lord considers sufficient evidence to them. He also considers sufficient evidence to us to prove that he is a God of truth and righteousness. Unlike the Israelites at Mount Sinai, we have an additional 1,500 years or more of proof. What then would prevent us from answering the question, who is on the Lord's side? The Israelites at Mount Sinai had the truth and the evidence to support that truth. They had a choice to make. So do we. Just before his death and prior to entering the land of Canaan, Joshua recounted their history from Terah, the father of Abraham, to the present, their present, how God had blessed and preserved them in the face of their foes. Him and him alone they should serve. Who they would serve, the God of Abraham or the false gods of the land they were to occupy, only they can answer. But as recorded in Joshua 24, verse 15, Joshua made it clear who he and his house would serve. And it's, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorite in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people did serve the Lord. Well, succeeding generations did not. When Moses made the challenge to the people, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. He left no doubt that there was an urgency to his demand. They had to decide first if they were on the Lord's side. 
and then they would act have to act as demanded to demonstrate their disposition. To them, it was a matter of salvation. Search, uh, such decisions were urgent then, and salvation remains an urgent matter today. The consequences are such that no delay is warranted. In Isaiah the 49th chapter, verse 8, the Lord's words were recorded. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth and cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. This was a prophetic utterance having to do with the promise of the Messiah. Paul repeated this in 2 Corinthians 6, chapter verse 2, when he said, For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Paul is saying that uh, Christ was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. And now is the time for full obedience to God. The rejection of God's provisions for our salvation is to deny its urgency. Jesus had a sense of urgency about the things that he must do. His words recorded in John 9, chapter verse 4. He says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. That reflected the urgent urgency inherent in obedience. The sage of old said to ponder the path of your feet and to let all your ways be established, Proverbs 4, chapter verse 26. In your pondering, please recognize that if you are on the Lord's side, you will be in a minority. Jesus told his disciples in part, if the world hates you, you will know that you know that it hated me before it hated you. And he goes on to say, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. In John, that's in John 15, chapter verse 18 through 20. That's just, just in part. You can read the rest of it on your own. Jesus said, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Matthew 7, chapter verse 14. But an assurance is given to those who obey him, that is, those who are on the Lord's side. In Romans 8, chapter verses 35 through 37, Paul said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As, as, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. This could be said of the sons of Levi who were in a minority in comparison with the great host of idolaters in the camp of Israel. They came out uh, boldly for the Lord and are therefore held in honor even to this day. And such could be said of us as well. They who are on the Lord's side must do as they are bidden. They must be prepared to obey all uh, Christ's commands to the letter and in the spirit of them, right to the end of life. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, verse 15. In Revelation 2.10, we're told to be faithful unto death. If we remain so, we would be given a crown of life. This thought is further emphasized in Revelation, the 22nd chapter, verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates the, uh, into the city. We cannot merely submit to God. We must resist the devil, as James wrote. Therefore, submit to God, resist, resist, uh, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. It's found in James 4, chapter verse 7 through 8. You are loved by the devil, 
if you have unclean hands, the impure heart, and are double-minded. Make no mistake about it. Resistance is warfare. Christ himself said, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse 34. Paul's words recorded in Romans 8, chapter, verse 31 are, if God is for us, who can be against us? Obviously, the devil is against us, but he has fled. Nevertheless, the devil and his minions are watching to see how we run the Christian race. We must ask, as Elijah did, how long will you falter between two opinions? 1 Kings 18, verse 21. If you prove, considering all what we said about what constitutes proof, if you prove Baal to be God, well, follow him. If you prove the Lord to be God, well, follow him. Make up your minds. Make no mistake, however, you will make up your mind and you will conduct your life accordingly. It is our humble prayer that you make up your mind to be on the Lord's side before it is everlastingly too late. That concludes our remarks and I hope it has been beneficial to you and you consider it further. Thank you.